you go. Good morning, everybody. Thank you guys for coming out. Uh, this is the OpenStack A to Z talk uh, or panel. Uh, we're, we're here from Comcast. We're extremely excited to be here. And uh, we thought we'd take this session to share a little bit about how we do OpenStack at Comcast. Uh, specifically, we plan, build, deploy, manage that platform. And we have some of our awesome engineers here to kind of share with you on that. So we're going to kind of go around, do a, a panel format here at the beginning, go through some quick questions that we prepared, and then we'll also have time for Q&A at the end. So uh, I think we'll just go ahead and, and kick it right off. So the first question is, can you provide an overview of the environment? Maybe Sheila, you can take that for us? Sure. So the Comcast Cloud team was formed in July of 2012, and we released our first proof of concept in November. I'm sorry, in July. And then uh, we went into production in November. Uh, we were running Essex at the time, and since then we are running all over the nation in several data centers. Uh, we are running Havana now, and we are moving to Ice House. We, uh, one more thing I should add. We do have multiple uh, customer-facing apps, internal and external, that are running on the cloud today. Parts of X1, we have Xfinity Share, we have our internal conferencing system. We have tools that we use, such as Etherpad, IRC, ZNC Bouncer. Everything's on the cloud. So, and much more that I just haven't listed. Awesome. Thank you, Sheila. So, Scott, could you tell us how we uh, have expanded our footprint and upgraded from Essex uh, to Havana? Um, yes. Uh, can you repeat that question one more time? Sure. How did you expand your footprint and upgrade from Essex to Havana? Uh, so we've had a lot of challenges with uh, upgrading uh, and um, expanding because customer, customer uh, demand has kind of outpaced us in a lot of ways. Um, we still have some Essex uh, uh, environments uh, deployed and uh, we've been moving people to Havana. Uh, most of our environments Havana and um, the challenge that we've had with uh, upgrading the Essex environment is that uh, you can't just do a live upgrade. You have to kind of nuke and pave it. So we're in, in the process of uh, uh, expanding our footprint to get those users off and uh, absorb those into the Havana environment. We're also rolling out Icehouse, and uh, we'll have to do uh, something similar. But with Icehouse, we're experimenting uh, with, in Havana, we're experimenting with uh, looking at live upgrade options so it won't be nearly as disruptive. Great. Thank you. Warren or Anton, can you guys maybe share a little bit about, you know, the other critical piece of cloud, which is storage, and what backends uh, we have implemented? Sure. Um, so, um, you know, back when we started off our journey in the Essex days, we sort of had this uh, idea that it was just going to be ephemeral and uh, object storage, and there would be no block storage. Uh, I guess looking back, this is probably a little bit naive. Um, so we had more and more customers ask about block storage. People, uh, for better or worse, also found uh, Nova Volumes. Um, so you know, we started um, looking into uh, Ceph once uh, Cinder uh, materialized. Um, we launched our first uh, Ceph cluster somewhere around the, the Hong Kong summit. Um, and then since then, we've, uh, I think we've got over a dozen Ceph clusters. Um, and uh, it's, it's really been sort of exploding in size. Awesome. Maybe, Anton, you can share some of the challenges we have of running stuff at that scale? Um, sure. So uh, we definitely, I think, like uh, most people that run stuff, uh, at least uh, the people that we've talked to at this conference, um, you know, we started out with uh, uh, poor configuration choices uh, with hardware, um, also with some of the config choices for Ceph configuration on the software side. Um, uh, so we, for just to give an example, we started out with uh, no SSDs for journals, then uh, then we went to uh, really crappy SSDs for journals, um, then we went to better uh, SSDs for journals, and now we're actually switching to like uh, PCI uh, uh, SSDs, and, and then. We're also looking and starting to switch to NVMe um, SSDs for journals. Um, so that's that's been uh, so. Uh, Ceph is is incredibly uh, resilient, um, uh, but uh, we've had massive failures, and uh, Ceph just uh, you know takes it and keeps going. Uh, we we had one cluster that um, uh, it was like six nodes, and um, it, we lost one node, then we lost another node, and then we lost another node. <laughs> so we went from six nodes to three nodes, and we actually kept going. And you know, obviously, as it rebuilds, it's a little bit um, uh, it's a little bit slower, but um, um, it just kept going. So, so that's uh, that's really cool with Ceph. 
Awesome. Uh, Sheila, can you maybe describe some of the maintenance of the environment, the upgrades, the migrations, kind of the, the nitty gritty that maybe we don't often get into here at the summit? Sure, absolutely. We, um, we, go, we go through maintenances, break, fi break fixes, uh, and we follow a strict change management process that we put together. We make sure that our customers are notified fully uh, prior to the maintenance. We discuss it with the team and we create tickets internally so that we can keep track of what's going on. So, and that includes break fixes with incident management. We, you know, if there's an incident and we need to change something immediately, we will. And um, s planned and scheduled maintenances as well. Uh, so on the, the storage side of things, uh, particularly with Ceph, um, it's a little bit easier. We're relatively up to date on Ceph. We're running uh, the, the latest uh, Firefly, basically. Um, I think that uh, we sort of uh, learned to hang back a little bit on the, uh, the release of Ceph, but um, we've been able to do things like um, add hosts, take away hosts, uh, re-image them, update the kernels, um, largely without too much user impact. Great. Uh, what happens if our cloud goes down, Sheila? Oh. So the cloud has not gone down as of today, thankfully. But uh, as a whole, right? So as a whole, yes. yes. Oh. So we've had individual data centers. <laughs> we, go down. we have, and we do encourage our customers to build in multiple data centers throughout the region, nation, um, as, and make it as redundant as possible. So, so yeah, we encourage uh, pushing resiliency up to the application layer, right? And so that they can survive any single data center outage. Maybe, Chuck, you can share about how we support multiple locations. Sure. Uh, so we, we do have uh, multiple centers that we uh, implement as regions, and uh, depending on the type of the region, whether it's a national data center or a more local regional data center, we, we encourage people to uh, bring up their applications in more than one site because uh, with the local data centers, they might actually have a problem every now and then. They're not as redundant as the national ones are. Uh, now, of course, this also brings a little complexity to the uh, users, too. They have to deal with things like uh, um, inconsistent uh, IDs for images and so forth, too. So we try to make that as painless as possible for people by uh, synchronizing uh, all of the IDs and things like that. Or at least that's, that's the plan. So uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, Anton, can you share with us what are some of the default settings we had to change to make things work better in our environment, like our lessons learned, best practices? Uh, sure. So um, uh, I would say the biggest thing we, we, we went through was uh, changing the uh, RAM overcommit. Uh, from 150% uh, uh, down to 95%, uh, just because uh, in some of the like the higher uh, loaded environments, uh, as uh, as VMs uh, actually start to use the the RAM on the compute node, um, you 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 run out you run out of RAM, and then uh, it uh, a random VM gets uh, killed by by the kernel, and so. So we, we actually, you know, we were seeing uh, strange behavior like that, and then we, we quickly figured out what it was. So we, we went from 150% uh, to 95%, and uh, actually now we're, uh, we're completely out of capacity in some locations, and so we're actually looking uh, to change that a little bit, and I think we're looking at like 115%. Uh, but we're going to look individually in, into each environment, and... Um, uh, and see like what the actual utilization is, and I, I think we uh, we're deciding that we're going to choose per environment. We're going to you know change that setting per environment. Um, on some of the uh, some of the Ceph side, um, so basically, uh, if you guys uh, didn't see it, if you guys saw the T Time Warner cable talk on Ceph, uh, it's basically exactly the same thing that uh, that they are having uh, problems with. We're having exact same problems. Coincidentally. Um, uh, <laughs> So, uh, so for example, uh, by default, uh, some of the default settings with Ceph, uh, like for recovery, uh, so uh, max OSD uh, backfills and uh, max recovery, um, we set both of those to one uh, because uh, by default, like if you have a failure, either like a node fails or a hard drive, or, you know, an OSD fails, um, the Ceph cluster will basically DOS itself, uh, trying to shuffle all the data around. So, uh, so that that was a huge thing. On some of our larger um, uh, Ceph clusters, uh, we had an interesting issue where Ceph, as it like the the memory utilization spikes up uh, with Ceph, uh, the kernel isn't able to uh, keep up with uh, allocating the RAM. So we had to change the uh, min-free k bytes uh, setting in the kernel. Um, 
uh, we went to, I think we can mention it. So we went from uh, like the default, which is like 90 uh, uh, megabytes to one gig, and we still had some issues, so we, now we're at uh, two gigabytes. Um, so that that's helped us with that. Um, there's obviously some other tuning things with like uh, max PIDs and uh, uh, the max uh, port counts and stuff like that, with stuff that we have to change. Awesome, thank you, Anton. Um, Chuck, maybe you can share with us how we add new customers to the cloud and how do we support them? Okay. So uh, for us, we have a, uh, an in-house tool to actually do all of the heavy lifting uh, for adding users to, to the uh, environment. Uh, shout out to Tim Milliken, our co uh, coworker here, for putting that together. Thanks, Tim. Uh, now, as far as support goes, that actually begins before people even have access to the cloud because we'll offer to meet with them, uh, do what we call an intake call where we discuss the cloud. And of course, a lot of these people have, they've never even heard about cloud before, but they find themselves you know, being urged uh, to go take a look and investigate. So uh, we try to inform them of the ways of the cloud and uh, you know, get them to cross over. Uh, now, as far as when they actually have access to the cloud, we send out what we call a welcome letter, and it has lots of good information to internal and external pointers uh, for uh, resources, including some videos and so forth, uh, very cool resources uh, we've developed, as well as ones that we found out in the, out in the net. And then, uh, of course, after they've had access to the cloud, we provide support via an internal IRC channel. Uh, it's, it is, I have to admit, very, very uh, disruptive sometimes during our day, but it is such a benefit to our users that uh, we can't imagine not providing it now. And actually, I'll set a little bit of context. I know we mentioned this when we were uh, sliding in on the couch, uh, but our cloud is serving internal customers within Comcast. So, th so things like our products and services run on our cloud, and we have approximately 600 different projects or tenants running on our cloud today, about 1,500 different users. But we are internally focused. I just wanted to set the context uh, for the room there. Um, Anton, maybe you can share with us how we support custom code changes within the environment. Uh, sure. So um, uh, we uh, we keep our configuration consistent with uh, tools like uh, Puppet and uh, Git, uh, GitLab. Um, so we have our own internal GitLab. Um, as uh, uh, as somebody on uh, on the team makes a change, we go through a peer review process. Uh, so we need to have uh, I think two or three uh, plus ones from somebody on the uh, on on the team, uh, and then uh, those changes will get merged. Um, and then, uh, as uh, as we're we're ready for like a, a new release, uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll bundle those changes into uh, into a tag, uh, and then the uh, uh, the operations team will uh, will take that, uh, will schedule a maintenance, uh, will uh, provide uh, like um, uh, documentation on what what are some of the changes. Uh, for example, we after we launched Havana, we uh, we added like uh, live migration after the fact, um, uh, some other stuff like that. Um, and so, so uh, we'll use uh, Ansible uh, to pull down the changes into each individual environment, and then uh, uh, Puppet will push those changes out to all the compute nodes in the environment. Uh, awesome. Scott, can maybe you share how our maintenance processes are evolving and changing to uh, adapt to an ever-growing cloud? Uh, yeah. So uh, when we first started, uh, we had a small enough cloud that we could uh, do maintenances and and get through it. Uh, but we're running into the, uh, the the size issue. You know, the bar, bigger the environment gets, uh, the more time it takes to get through a maintenance, like any one of these vulnerability maintenances that. Uh, uh, that come out these days, uh, a very large environment, you could be spending weeks and weeks uh, trying to push through. Our policy has always been one environment uh, per day, no more, because uh, uh, doing more than one environment in introduces risk where uh, if you didn't foresee the changes that you're making were going to cause some kind of issue with the, the customers on that cloud, then you've just kind of enhanced that by propagating that across multiple environments. Um, we have uh, recently uh, improved our process for uh, automating our maintenances, trying to be as hands-off as possible. Uh, we're using Ansible quite a bit more to uh, create the playbooks necessary to uh, make all the changes end-to-end, -end, as well as the verifications uh, and validation. Uh, of the cloud after the maintenances are done. So what I foresee is going to happen is that uh, because the automation has improved for doing the maintenances, we will now have to go back the other way and start doing multiple uh, environments per day just in order to be able to get through something um, in a relatively short period of time. 
Um, we've doubled our environment uh, in the last six months. We're doubling it again by the end of the year. Uh, next year looks like it's going to be a pretty rocking year. Um, uh, Maintenance-wise, uh, you know, from an operation standpoint, it's something pretty much on the forefront of our mind. Um, yeah, so, yeah, he mentioned um, basically uh, doubling the, the compute environment. Our storage environment, um, it's been growing extremely rapidly um, over the last really year and, and even more so over the last just three months. Um, we're sort of exploding in size. I, I put up a little bit of a slide here just so you can get an idea. Um, but sort of trying to manage that capacity growth is, a, is really difficult. So some of the things that we've done is, you know, we've looked into um, how are we going to build out uh, SEF to manage some of this capacity need. Um, so we diverged a little bit from uh, typical recommendations. We're, we're doing like 4U boxes that have a, a lot of drives in them. I know the SEF community, even Sage himself, has kind of warned us about um, using the really big boxes for SEF. Um, but we do make it work. It works probably. I think the, even the Red Hat guys, um, they're coming around a little bit on it, and uh, they realize that um, it works a little bit better than expected. But um, it's definitely uh, not insignificant to tune and run these. But it's, it's also easier to build a house with bricks than it is with Legos. So, uh, you, you know, we, we didn't want to kind of monopolize the entire time with prepared questions, so I think we're going to open it up to the audience. We've set a little bit of context of what we do at Comcast, but maybe we can. The one thing I ask is either if you can come up to the Q&A mic here, or if you're on this other room, I can share my mic with you so that the questions are captured on, uh, on video. So I think we're going to go ahead and open it up to questions. Hi. Um, how big is the team that you have support, supporting your cloud, and are they dedicated to that team? So uh, I'll take that one. Uh, I don't know that we can share exact numbers of how many we are on the team right now, but we are, they are dedicated. We have three teams today, um, dev, uh, uh, engineering, and operations. Uh, I would say that, you know, that they're relatively small for the size of the infrastructure we support. Uh, we also do support, which might be different than some uh, clouds today, a lot of uh, diversity in applications, right? So uh, we're not just running a bunch of web apps, right? We run video apps, we run voice apps that are sensitive to jitter and, and latency and whatnot. Uh, we run uh, video apps that have high bandwidth demands, uh, apps that have high packet per second rates. Now we're looking at doing, you know, some of the NFV stuff. And when you look at NFV, it's got all sorts of crazy requirements to it, right? So a lot of our engineering and focus goes into how do we support these things at scale? Uh, part of our team, you know, led the IPv6 uh, effort to upstream IPv6 and OpenStack. So, we're, you know, we're doing some, some cool stuff and kind of pushing the envelope. Uh, and so that also might add some dynamics to the size of our team. Um, uh, uh, you know, so we also work with a lot of other teams at Comcast that support us. You know, um, uh, for example, we have a good representation from our network engineering group here at, Com at uh, OpenStack. So a good portion of what you saw on stage was from network engineering and, and other groups as well. Next question. We had a question over here. here one sec. Um, other than your fame at the OpenStack Summit since 2012, um, what was like really the some of the value propositions you had beginning this this journey? Um, and as you've had your success listed up there, what, what things you what additional value propositions do you encounter that you maybe didn't see before? Um, um, so I'll, I'll try to take this, and anyone can jump in as needed. Um, and and part two is. How, how did you guys, like, what are some of the processes and role changes you guys had to really adapt to in making this move? So I'll answer the uh, value proposition part, at least, or, or try to. Um, <clears throat> so I think when we started this, uh, you know, there, there were a few options at the time in terms of what you were going to do with cloud, right? You were going to go to a, a public cloud, or you're going to pay um, some vendor to try and do it for you. Um, and I think one of the options, uh, one of the nice things about OpenStack is that you can, you can bring it in-house. You can be part of a, a, a vibrant community, right? So when, when we were looking at this, there were a couple choices available for, you know, running your own cloud. Um, and the thing is we were seeing increased velocity uh, towards OpenStack. And so that sort of uh, at least put us uh, with the crowd. And we realized that, you know, we could build a, a community and build internal knowledge as opposed to, you know, sort of paying someone to do that. 
and uh, like personally for for me it's it's great to um, be in an environment like this uh, it forces me to reach out to the community and talk to folks as opposed to you know just uh, being siloed um, so can you ask the process part of your question again what is it, how how did we evolve over time uh, yeah. given um, so that has been kind of challenging because, uh, I mean, as with most people here uh, uh, at the summit, you have to start somewhere, and usually somewhere is with practically no knowledge about the uh, OpenStack and how to put together a cloud and run it. Um, and and we had to figure that out on, uh, as we moved along the process. But the other piece of it, which uh, has affected us quite a bit, is uh, how do you get the user base there? You know, you build it, will they come? You got to really market it, and you got to uh, not only market it, but you also have to market it in the right way. That uh, you know, you, you, is it pets versus cattle? Uh, how are these different from typical virtual machines that may run on, let's say, VMware? Um, or how, how do you take a physical application and move it into the virtual world that works in the OpenStack environment? And, and how do you take an application that typically uses uh, infrastructure uh, that helps you uh, provide that HA? How do you take that HA aspect and cook it into the application so that you're not dealing, not relying on the hardware so much for your HA infrastructure? Um, it's been an interesting challenge and we've just kind of had to grow that along the way. Um, you know, kind of looking back, I'm, I'm amazed at how far we've made it uh, with as much as has been going on. Next question. My question is regarding uh, how you implement environments when there's still, I assume there's still some gaps with OpenStack can provide today and uh, with versus what you want to do and how you, do you can you give us a, a list of those things and explain how you're going to cover those gaps? So I, I think one of the things that uh, probably a, a great example of that is uh, IPv6, right? So we had, to, we had to carry that internally for a while, but now it's actually upstream. So when you launch an instance in our cloud, you actually get a, a dual stacked instance. You get an IPv4 and IPv6 address. So um, it's just an example of one of the things that we do. We either carry the code internally or we have to set expectations with customers. Um, and hopefully with that expectation, there's um, some sort of timeline and expectation that um, we may eventually get that feature. Maybe we could also share, uh, maybe Anton, about how we, we, we had a gap by not having block storage for a long time, right? And then we actually, you know, worked with the community, found what others were doing and, and brought in a solution. Well, you just, you, you just answered the question. <laughs> Thanks. I fail as moderator. I, I, was, I was just going to add, like, we, we don't offer a load balancer as a service, for example. Yeah, so, but we do provide, um, uh, like, great instructions for people on how to deal with that. And so we have some external tools for that. Uh, there's a couple of different ways how you can manage that, right? Uh, we encourage, like somebody said earlier, we encourage people to, to deploy their resiliency on the application layer. And uh, we tell just on every call, we basically repeat that uh, with customers. Uh, and it's still not enough. Uh, uh, but, uh, but you know, you can, you can do that with the DNS load balancing. We do have some, you know, hardware load balancers, but that's not part of uh, our OpenStack right now. So, so to kind of add on a little bit with that, uh, it, you know, and it kind of goes, goes back to the, the, the whole process thing. Uh, one of the other things that we've encouraged all our, uh, of our own internal customers to do is to kind of rely on themselves as a knowledge of information. And there are places within Comcast where, uh, where users can ask questions, uh, how do I do, um, you know, software load balancing? How do I uh, do, you know, particular networking type things? Uh, and and uh, our user community has actually been pretty active in helping answer those questions. And sometimes uh, they have the answers that we don't have, which is also very good. Yeah, if you remember that IRC channel we mentioned too, that it's getting to the point now where frequently uh, other users will answer questions from you know, newer users too. It's kind of working out very well as far as we're concerned. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, I was just going to add the same thing that Chuck just said. We have an internal forum as well that sometimes we push people to participate in. And it's just awesome seeing other customers giving feedback and advice to our other customers about how they're doing things. Cool. Yes, uh, I'd like to hear some of the examples of onboarding process or, and uh, 
how much freedom you give to the uh, the tenant or admin project admin, and how do you control uh, cloud uh, cloud sprouts? Okay, what was the last part? How do we control cloud? Well, well everybody sprawl. is sprawl. Okay, right. All, right, I'll talk. all right. Well, uh, as far as the the how we uh, deal with people, how we we get them on board in the first place, uh, generally a lot of the questions that we have are related to how are our environment set up. For example, they, they want to do this particular thing in networking, and they, they need to know, okay, how do I make that happen in uh, one of the clouds, or is it even possible? Uh, and uh, generally, though, uh, it, it goes along those lines, and, um, and then there are also questions where uh, we have to defer to other groups, too, as well, because we're learning as, as our uh, customers are learning as well, too. So we'll frequently refer people to other teams and, and people who have done things before. So uh, it's interesting how users actually approach us to get on the cloud. Uh, and a lot of times they will see them actually come into our IRC channel and ask, how do I get on your cloud? Uh, I've talked to so-and-so, and, and they told me about it. I want to be on there. Um, and then very often we'll see it, uh, stuff come down the management chain, and which will then be passed off to this. But in all cases, we just generally push everybody to the ticketing system and say, this is where you start. And the, the, the whole ticket process that, uh, that drives the intake will ask uh, various questions like, what is it you're trying to do? How big is it that you're trying to do? What kind of resources are you looking at? Uh, um, are there any special needs uh, that we need to be aware of? And, and more importantly, do you want more information about the cloud? Do you want us to come talk to you about uh, how to get on our cloud? So that's a very important aspect of the process. Well, one thing we do have, right, is a goal to automate a lot of that onboarding this year, right? So that it's not actually a ticket process just to even get set up on the cloud. Part of that whole process thing. Yeah. <laughs> do you want to address also the uh, part about Sprawl? Yeah, so uh, we're still kind of in our infancy uh, for dealing with sprawl in general, and I'm sure that's not helped with our capacity issues. Uh, it's so easy to get on the cloud that, uh, um, you know, that's typical of any virtual environment. Uh, I'm sure there's quite a number of uh, uh, VMs that are sitting idle and, and, and not being addressed. But we do have uh, uh, quite a bit of things on uh, on our roadmap to try to address these, like looking at Janitor Monkey and and looking using Solometer to, to help uh, identify the, the various VMs that may be uh, dead weight or just kind of flat lined and not, not doing anything. And uh, the showback models will help encourage people also to, uh, <laughs> to um, you know, make better use of their resources because uh, they may eventually get charged back for that kind of stuff. Maybe we'll actually implement uh, something like Cloud Minion. There was another talk, uh, I think, yesterday on that, too, and it, looked, it was a very good talk. That's definitely something we need to look into. Cool. Have you noticed uh, vendors approaching you to start using your cloud? Start using our cloud or to yeah. provide their cloud offerings? No, <laughs> we uh, do so, get that. So no, well, like, like, uh, like give us an example. Um, well, if in, instead of you know selling you a bunch of servers that you probably already have to operate their own internal cloud, have you started having vendors approach you to run on your internal crowd, cloud? Yeah, right. So, uh, yeah. I mean, our, our cloud is, uh, is completely private uh, to us, so we don't advertise anywhere externally for, for people to get that impression to come to our cloud. Correct. So I don't really think so. So we do something a little bit different. With, uh, so we have a lot of vendors in general at Comcast supporting applications and whatnot. And what we do do is encourage them to actually either build their own internal OpenStack clouds or use a public OpenStack cloud to vet their application on OpenStack. Before, so that when they come to try to run it in OpenStack at Comcast, it's already working, right? right? So we do do that, right? But we're not necessarily, we're, we're our, our security models, everything are really focused around internal use today. Uh, well, we don't really extend that outside of uh, Comcast or Comcast NBC and, and properties today. Uh, hold on, I gotta get the mic over. Do you then, or, okay, sorry. Hi, uh, this has been very interesting. Uh, I'm enjoying it. Uh, could you speak to your capacity planning process and onboarding new apps and growth in, in your existing environment? Who owns the cap budget and things like that and what you've run into? 
so I'll uh, I'll just uh, start off with the uh, uh, the storage capacity thing. So like uh, uh, Scott was mentioning, you know, people will will put in the ticket and they'll say like, oh, I need you know half a petabyte of storage, uh, and then <laughs> we'll all freak out and we'll we'll be like, wait, 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 let, let's let's talk about what is it that you're doing. So we'll get more information. Um, we we have a fairly lengthy. Um, uh, Acurement process, uh, so so it takes us a while for to get things uh, you know ordered, delivered, racked, cabled, networked, you know everything like that. So so we do have to plan um, uh, very carefully. Um, we have to set expectations very carefully uh, to to let people know. So if there's like a large project that comes down the the pipe and, and says like, hey, I need a bunch of stuff, um, compute, uh, memory, uh, storage, um, we will tell them, okay, well, are you guys already like on our cloud? Um, what you know? What what are your um, what are your uh, like I/O requirements? Uh, sometimes that's easy to get from people. Sometimes it's very difficult. Um, and uh, and then you know usually like for larger uh, projects it's better managed uh, you know on upper management uh, levels and um, uh, we'll we'll know well in advance uh, that something large is coming uh, towards our way. Um, so we'll we'll be able to uh, you know order things uh, in time. One of the things that we're actually just kicking off because we do struggle with this issue is uh, we've actually, we're um, building out an internal CRM, uh, customer relationship management, right? And actually uh, reaching out to all our customers trying to understand their capacity, right? Uh, we're almost trying to operate a little bit as an internal business unit, right? And saying like, hey, what's, what's, what's your projections? Where are you? What are the issues you're seeing? What features do you want? Uh, and starting to, to build that data uh, uh, and so that it can drive better drive our decisions. I've really enjoyed this discussion, and you guys have really been a great success program for OpenStack, and some of the operational processes you've clearly thought through and have in place are really well, well done, so thank you. I had a question about, as the enthusiasm for OpenStack grows at Comcast, how do you evaluate OpenStack projects and new functionality that OpenStack is releasing and how you determine when or if you'll incorporate those new projects into your cloud? Um, so that's a really good question and I think um, I don't have a really great answer on that one but uh, what we really try to focus on are the core projects um, and then beyond the core projects if, if people are looking into or asking us specifically about uh, projects um, you know we're we have a lot of folks here, and we keep our ear to the ground on what the current state of OpenStack projects is, um, you know, all the way from incubation through, you know, eventually being promoted. Um, and so we do sort of try to lay out uh, like a, a timeline for those customers or goal um, if we're going to ever accept uh, the project into our own cloud. Yeah, one of the cool things is kind of the ecosystem that's kind of bubbling up at Comcast where, for example, we actually had a, a database team approach us and saying, can we actually build and run Trove on top of your cloud and work with you on this effort, right? And we're like, hey, that's great, right? Because we don't have the operational capability to, to maintain a platform, a database as a service platform, right? We're more an infrastructure as a service team, this specific team, right? But this team that happens to be, you know, nearby us saying, hey, can we, can we do this, right? Because they see this as the natural, natural evolution of where, you know, data persistence is going. Uh, and so they're working hard, they're testing out Trove, they're proof, doing all the proof of concepts and whatnot. And we're trying to figure out what, what does this ecosystem model look like? You know, we have other teams doing similar models with things maybe up the stack or parallel to the stack and working to integrate within the ecosystem to be able to deliver a service. And we also have a feature request page that we send our customers to. Um, if they want to run something and they think it's really cool and there's a bunch of them, we just send them to the page and then our architecture team takes a look at it, works with development, and eventually rolls it out. Hi, I'd like to know how uh, your team built up the OpenStack expertise uh, it seems that these are very mission critical applications and obviously uh, there has to be some systematic way of developing skill set, including, by the way, new hire as well. I think being picky was one of them. <laughs> um, it, you know, 
the process of picking talent over, over the last several years has changed. We started off with just a, a few of us on the core team and uh, have had to grow uh, just out of uh, sheer necessity in order to uh, be able to grow our cloud. Um, we uh, at some point got big enough that uh, we were just one team. We had we had split, and and that's where operations and engineering architecture kind of kind of uh, diverged a little bit. But despite that, we all work extremely closely. We're all in the same area. Uh, we talk to each other every day, and we act as uh, still one big team, even though uh, some of the stuff that we do is uh, different from each other. Um, from a talent acquisition side, uh, I think that being picky about who we bring into our team has been very important and is not necessarily expertise because OpenStack expertise is actually very difficult to acquire as a general rule. Um, all around us, we have lots and lots of Linux engineers and a small fraction of them have heard of OpenStack and then an even smaller fraction have even played with it or have much uh, uh, knowledge about uh, how to install it or do anything. Um, so we do a lot of training <laughs> internally. Well, well, but we've had a lot of success stories bringing on uh, Linux engineers from within the company uh, and network yeah, engineers. Exactly. And, and we've also had success. I think our operations team is a, maybe you're not tooting your own horn there a little bit, but we've had a great <laughs> uh, success program in terms of hiring green engineers, uh, young engineers coming out of college and, and, uh, or just one or two years of experience and then training them up as well on the operations right. side. Right, uh, and so we've kind of pulled from all directions, and um, yeah. And so it's kind of that evolving process. Uh, we, we we're trying to find the experts, and then we've come down to let's let's get some more juniors in there and train them up. And and now we're about to kind of look at the other side again. Let's try to get some more uh, experts if we can. Uh, but uh, to to kind of restate what Andrew said is that. Um, as our user base has grown within Comcast, and we've got over 1,500 users now using our cloud, um, we have been able to pull from that resource of users who now have experience uh, as a user in our cloud, know the technology, know how to deploy their applications, and we have uh, brought a number of them into our, our team, and they have been assets uh, to us with regards to uh, continuing to grow. And I think there's one last place for a source, is actually the community itself, while it is competitive, right? The meetups we run, the operators meetups, the local meetups have been a great source of talent for us. And also being like, I think there is a, an attractiveness to a lot of engineers for working for somebody who's actually operating OpenStack versus being a vendor of OpenStack and having maybe a slightly different agenda or what might not be, right? So we actually are, are an exciting place to work because we really do care about OpenStack. We care about open source. We care about upstreaming the work we do. We care about our community participation. And I think that's those values have helped draw in the, uh, a wonderful team to, to kind of contribute back there. Thank you. We got three minutes left, all right. We got a question. So a uh, question about release scheduling. I understand not just upgrading instantly on what you've got running, but as you're planning out your next session, why are you staying so far behind? Uh, so we have uh, internal uh, patches that we have to carry and vet against uh, the next version. And I think that's uh, probably the primary reason that um, we get dragged down. Um, you know, even after uh, an OpenStack release comes out, um, we've got a dev cycle of like, I think we've evaluated it to be on the, the month's time frame to, um, to basically integrate our code into the new releases. And it kind of depends on where we are, but um, like primarily like Neutron, we have a, um, a patch for Neutron that's uh, been pretty painful for us to carry along. I mean, I think one of the things, we, we do try to um, uh, upstream our patches, but one of the things too is uh, we didn't focus on building out CI, CD early on, continuous integration, continuous delivery, and because we do carry custom patches, right? Not everybody needs to carry them. Uh, we had some stuff that we, we were doing with QoS that we hadn't upstreamed yet, uh, or hadn't been able to get upstream yet. Uh, we're working to get that upstream, but we've also built out a good CI CD pipeline now, which will hopefully enable us to, to, to do those things faster. I think maybe time for one last question, and then we uh, uh, have to wrap up. Anybody else have a question? <laughs> <laughs> Hi guys. 
It sounds like you're well on your way towards hyperscaling OpenStack. Um, if you could give one piece of advice to maybe some of the people here who are just starting their journey, uh, what would it be? Well, just what we were talking about earlier, don't write custom code. Just <laughs> <laughs> well, no, well, let, me, let me rephrase that a little bit. Upstream your code, right? Work with the community, upstream it, right? We did that with V6. We no longer carry anything with V6. Works great, right? Uh, so I think that's a great example. Um, it, there is investment to work with the community, but we, we feel it's well worth it. And, uh, and kind of to the community, I, I, one, don't give up. Yeah. <laughs> because uh, uh, OpenStack is a, an extremely challenging thing to set up, uh, especially if you're coming into it new and you don't understand what OpenStack is or how it all works. It takes a lot of effort to get it up and going. Um, don't give up and rely on the community. Come to the summits, uh, come to the meetups, and take advantage of the vast amount of knowledge that uh, happens to be. Everybody else has already had that, had that kind of pain. Yeah, and, and I think the community is key there, um, that you can kind of get that help level we have one. I'm going to kind of uh, use a moment to pitch our favorite event, which is the OpenStack Operators Mid Cycle Meetups, right? So, in between the summits, the big summits, uh, so every six months, three months from now, right? So, probably first week of August or late July, um, somewhere, I think, uh, unfortunately for our international, it's usually been in the US, we get together with just operators. There's no salespeople, there's no vendors, um, that type of stuff. It's people who operate OpenStack clouds. Everything from People operate like a little small, you know, 20 node cluster to, you know, close to hyperscale sized uh, OpenStack. And we sit there and talk about our best practices, what things work, what pieces of equipment work well, what ways work well, how do we solve keystone scaling, how do we solve that, you know, all these type of things we learn there. So we're not in this on our own. I mean, there's a mailing list, there's IRC, but the meetups have also been great for us. So I think we're out of time. So um, thank you all. And uh, we're going to hang around here for a few minutes and have a question. Thank you guys. Take a bow.